Okay, thank you, Bernhard. Uh, can everyone hear me? It seems I'm getting some signal here. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been, as Bernhard said, for uh, seven and a bit years uh, out of the academic world, uh, building actual products at Google. So, I wasn't in research at Google, but actually an engineering director. And after that little adventure, I'm planning a comeback in the academic world. Uh, but that shouldn't concern you much because today uh, the topic is really uh, structured prediction where I will mainly focus on large margin methods uh, in my talk. So um, let me provide you a bit of motivation. Uh, I can really do this quickly. Um, in general, in, in machine learning, supervised machine learning, the, the classical paradigms have always been binary classification uh, or uh, regression with a real valued output. But of course, uh, in practice, or if you look uh, across many domains, there's, there's, there's really interesting problems that deal with much more complicated outputs that you want to predict. Or cases where really it's not just about predicting a single output in isolation, but having a combination of outputs and uh, with some interdependencies, and you want to make a consistent, somewhat consistent um, prediction over these multiple outputs. So when we talk about structured outputs here, or structured prediction, um, we can have situations where we have really multiple labels. We can have actual structured objects, such as strings or trees or uh, labeled graphs, and so on and so forth. And uh, all of this can be captured in the same framework as I will try to explain. Um, the challenge is that while if you think, for instance, about a combination of response variables that you all want to predict jointly, uh, you could, of course, try to predict individual pieces. Um, but the idea in structured prediction is really that at the end of the day, you want some holistic prediction. And that's just not uh, a combination of independent predictions of pieces, but you somehow need to tie it together. So it's this jigsaw metaphor, if you like. So, um, so I will give you, so, so this is mainly meant uh, once the slides uh, get distributed also to provide you some references to the world of applications, uh, which I won't talk much about more as motivating background, um, but I won't go deep on any of the applications. But I want you to understand that it's worth um, knowing and learning about uh, structured prediction problems because they do arise for a lot of things that are um, still pretty hot in some of these areas. So the first area where um, these method methods have been used is in natural language processing and understanding. So you have uh, problems, everything from part of speech tagging, named entity recognition, to uh, parsing of sentences, let's say with dependency trees or semantic parsing. So here's an example where uh, you're given some, some sentence, so that would be uh, some x uh, given input, and what you would like to predict is really a parse tree uh, that uh, represents uh, a correct syntactic parse for the tree and also in some sense the most likely one, the correct one that you would expect. Um, there's, uh, if you look at this starting from about 2004, there have been a number of papers up until very recently where people have also used the techniques for uh, everything from machine translation to uh, some exciting work that's happening uh, in Michael Collins' group and Luke Zettelmeyer on uh, learning to map sentences to logical forms. So this is a much deeper language understanding. And, and th what they have in common is that we think that linguistically there, there is a deeper structure that Right, should represent kind of the surface form of the sentences, and we would like to find that deeper structure, logical structure, parse tree. We would like to predict that given, uh, given a sentence, and how can we do that? How can we develop methods uh, for those problems? In information retrieval, there's also a number of applications. If you think about just the fundamental problem of search engines, of learning to rank, then often this is done by predicting some real valued score and then ranking items on that score, right? So whatever, if I want to rank web pages, I assign, given a query, I assign a score and then I just rank order them by the score. But that often is suboptimal because you don't look at uh, really the value, the, the utility of the ranking overall. So sometimes you would like to have a utility function over the whole ranking and then Right, that, that doesn't just depend on individual scores, but really on like pairwise ordering and things like that. 
Multi-document summarization, another example that has been uh, investigated the last couple of years where the idea is you have multiple documents and you want to construct a summary by picking up pieces from different documents that you potentially put in the summary. So that would be uh, a summary where you would actually select things. Uh, you could also generate summaries. In all these cases, again, a summary, it's really important. It's not just a bag of words, but, but it's a question of a co in combination, what does that summary cover? Um, there's things like that are very dear, of course, to my heart, like whole page click-through predictions and things like that that we work on in Google, understanding where people click on a page, where in reality you can think of it in the following way. There's a user query, we produce a complicated output, let's say, right, the Google search results. And now we'd like to understand, like, what's the probability that people click on different things and maybe we have some utility function overall. And you can imagine that's very complicated because if I put an image, whatever, very prominently on the page, then that attracts a lot of clicks and then, you know, other things on the page will not get as many clicks. So you get into a situation where you need to think holistically about what you show to a user in order to predict the types of things you're interested in. So again, um, that cannot be just modeled as, as standard regression. And then there's things like uh, entity linking reference resolution. Um, I won't go into that much detail, but there's a lot of uh, things, again, you can follow up on that. There's also, let me uh, speed up a little bit here, uh, in computer vision, um, things like image segmentation, very naturally, you have multiple label variables that you would like to jointly predict. You have things like scene understanding, where it's not just about recognizing individual objects, but being able to model dependency between these objects and where they appear in a page. Uh, localization and so on and so forth. So there's also some work on that also very recently, the last year and two. Um, and then also computational biology, there, there's been some work that has been using these methods uh, for things like function prediction uh, or, or pro uh, protein structure prediction, gene finding, splicing, and Gunnar Rech, uh, who's been here at Tübingen for a large part of his career, has been very active in that area. So that's just like as a motivation, and if you work in some of these application areas, maybe you've already run across those, or if you're interested, you can uh, follow up some of the literature. Okay, so, uh, so this is kind of the overview of the two lectures, the one today and tomorrow. Um, I'll introduce first kind of the model, the, the, the setting that we will work in of structured prediction. Um, I will then spend most of the lecture on more algorithmic aspects of uh, how you can actually, in a scalable manner, um, uh, find um, solutions to these problems. And then in the second part, deal with decomposition-based. Uh, so the first class of methods I call oracle-based algorithms. The second part will then deal with decomposition-based algorithms. And then towards the end, dependent on time, we'll talk a little bit about other things. Okay, so um, should can I? Any questions so far? Okay. Then let's jump uh, into this. So um, to pose the, the problem more formally, uh, we can do it as follows. So there's an insp input space uh, X, there's an output space Y. Y can be very large in cardinality. Let, let's say cardinality is M. And that often is due to some combinatorial nature of the output. Uh, so you can think of that as being exponential in some other number. Uh, like the length of a sequence or a uh, number of nodes in a tree and so on and so forth. Um, and what we assume that we're given uh, some training data, like in the standard supervised uh, sense of pairs uh, x i, y i that are drawn from some unknown distribution d, uh, and these are just pairs over over the input output um, input output combinations. And what we want to find is a um, is a uh, oops, is a map uh, I denote by capital F uh, that just uh, for a given input predicts an output, and what we usually will also use here um, is some loss function I denote with this delta triangle that is a function from pairs of outputs uh, to the uh, non-negative reals such that um, on the same output it's zero and, and uh, on different outputs it's usually strictly greater than zero. So that is a loss function that will measure how bad it is, it's application dependent, how bad it is to predict uh, some y prime when the correct output was y. Uh, 
right? Since we have these complicated structures, that's really important because, let's say, right, in, predict in predicting, you might always make some mistake, let's say. You might never get the real structure, but so you need to have uh, a notion of uh, similarity or, or distance or, or, or like even uh, in the simplest case of course just a loss function like that that tells you um, how bad that is and so then the prediction error that we want to minimize is the expectation with regard to that distribution of that loss right so delta of uh, the correct y compared to the prediction um, that we make for this um, given fun for this function f um, so if we look at also some example loss functions, so that um, this becomes a little bit more concrete. Um, if you predict uh, multiple labels, let's say you have k labels, then a very natural loss function that people have used is just a Hamming loss. You look, let's say you have k labels, there's the correct labeling, let's say it's just binary minus one one, and then there's a predicted one, I can just look at how many uh, we have uh, in common or how many are different, and so then the number of uh, labels that are different, uh, that would be the Hamming loss between the two um, labelings, y and y prime. If I do things like uh, classification with a taxonomy of classes, so imagine uh, in text categorization or applications like that, you have uh, maybe thousands, tens of thousands of classes, and they are arranged in a taxonomy, and you would say that confusing classes that are very close to each other in the taxonomy is not as bad as confusing things that are you know, in very different parts of your taxonomy, then, for instance, you could also encode that in such a function delta by using something like a tree distance, let's say, um, like whatever, the distance to the first common parent or something like that. Uh, in applications like syntactic parsing, what you would use this uh, loss function to model is things like, for instance, the number of label spans on which y and y prime uh, do not agree. So you you take the two trees, you break them up into these uh, subtrees, and then you compare how many are different, and that is the loss that you count. Or in things like learning to rank, you might be interested in the mean average precision of some predicted ranking versus the optimal one. And uh, here your output space would be permutations, and then you, you have a, a, a loss function defined over your permutations. Okay, so, so this function is really uh, is kind of an interface. It will be an interface to our algorithms in the sense that uh, I would just assume that it is given, and I would like to devise methods that are pretty agnostic to uh, the specifics of how that function is defined. Okay, so let's look at uh, a first naive approach of how you could uh, how you could look at multi-class prediction. And that would basically be to apply more of a standard multi-class uh, approach. So we could just say, well, um, you know, we have m different classes uh, represented by y. m could be large, but let's just assume um, that's not a problem. We could define a family of discriminant functions, which are denoted by um, f here, and uh, yeah, um, which I denote by this little f here, and uh, they are indexed by an output y, so for each possible output y, I have some discriminant function, or think of it as a scoring function that takes an input and assigns a score. And then the way I could do uh, my actual prediction would be um, by using kind of a winner-takes-all rule where I say, well, I predict the output for which this scoring function or discriminant function produces the largest value relative to all other outputs that I could consider. Right. So. Um, relatively simple, and uh, in multi-class classification with, uh, in, in the linear case, for instance, uh, you would simply do it like this. You would have some shared input representation, just call it phi of x, so this is some d-dimensional vector that represents your inputs, and then each class has a weight vector, and then the score for that class you compute just as the inner product of that input representation with your weight vector. So this is like fairly common in uh, a way to do multi-class classification. The way then you would you would actually train, uh, let's say, a model. So how you would actually find the weight vectors? You could, for instance, do a, a one versus all binary classification. Okay, you say for each class, I had positive examples are the examples that belong to that class. Negative is the rest. So you train uh, f sub y. 
uh, based on that training set and then for some other Y you train it independently and then um, you just combine combine the scores in that way. Um, that um, of course, feels a little bit suboptimal, but is is pretty common. You could also combine it into, let's say, a single machine, um, where where basically, uh, for instance, you can generalize support vector machines. We'll talk about that or other uh, methods like logistic regression to deal with that case, um, and then you have a somewhat more principled approach. But the thing is that effectively, you introduce a separate parameter um, for each class here. Um, now, the problem, of course, is. Uh, for instance, right, in the extreme case, if we look at a situation where the number of classes is actually larger than the number of training examples that we have, then for sure we know that that cannot work, right? Because it kind of breaks down, right? If I have like uh, gazillions of classes because each class actually represents some combination of labels and there's just too many combinations and many combinations I've never seen, then this approach cannot work because I cannot learn uh, kind of a separate classification function or scoring function for each combination. And so the problem is in, in, in this approach so far that there's no generalization across outputs, right? Uh, one Y and another Y prime are just treated as being atomically like different and I don't exploit anything about the structure, the internal structure of my outputs and the things that they might share. Okay, so on the output side, I just have memorization, but no learning. So I need to go beyond that, and there's basically two lines of thought that are not orthogonal or exclusive, uh, but two philosophically, I think, different ways of thinking about it. One is to think of um, um, a feature-based prediction model where we say, okay, you know, we need to, we cannot just treat the output like atomically, we need to also define features for the output. So then really what we need is we need to extract combined features from input and outputs and then um, learn over that somehow combined representation, uh, figure out how we can do that. So the idea is there again also to separate the process of let's say feature engineering from the process then of actually learning and, 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 and the inference that you then do. And the other approach would be to say well um, let's think of it more in a factor graph type of approach where we actually ask ourselves whether we can decompose somehow the output space into groups of variables, let's say, and have like a specific decomposition of, of our discriminant functions f and things like that and see how whether we can use that to come up with effective methods for doing it. So I'll come back to this later and I'll start more with this uh, feature-based approach. So the feature-based approach, um, we'll introduce a little bit of like notation that I'll use consistently over the talk. Um, I denote by uh, Psi, uh, a feature map that is jointly extracting features from inputs and outputs. So it takes an input-output and maps it to RD. And uh, we can also think of uh, this in a kernel fashion of actually not having that explicit representation, but having giving some kernel on on input output pairs um, that we can evaluate there is many ways of constructing um, such feature maps a very uh, canonical and simple way uh, of doing it is to basically take uh, features extracted from inputs to take features extracted from outputs and to combine them to cross these features, right? So you would say it's a, it's effectively, it's like a conjunction, right? You have this feature, if it, 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 let's say these were all binary features, then you would say you have this feature present in the input and you have that feature present in the output, and then you represent that by a combined feature, right? Um, so then effectively, that might have some dimensionality, this might have some dimensionality, then the dimensionality you get overall is the product of the two. And um, so there's, you can be somewhat more selective about the feature crossing and you can also do other things that are not based on, on such feature crossing, but you know, I'll, I'll show you some example in a minute. Um, and, uh, but what's also nice about this specific construction is actually if it's some very simple algebra that tells you that if you compute then inner products uh, in that representation, that effectively uh, these inner products break down into products uh, into two terms that are just uh, a product of a kernel applied in the input space and a kernel applied in the output space, so that often is very convenient to do. So you have 
So you can think of it in the, sim in the following way, right? If you think of a kernel as being a similarity function, then the similarity of one input-output pair and the other input-output pair, you compare the similarity of the input, you compare the similarity of the outputs, and the joint similarity is the product of these two, right? So if the inputs are very dissimilar, then uh, also, um, you know, let's say they're even orthogonal or something like that, then um, this will be zero, and no matter what that is, you know, uh, the, the combination of these things will also be very dissimilar. Um, so I don't know whether that helps, but um, so that is like uh, often a very simple way of, of building these kernels. So I want to show you now some, some examples. So there's a little bit of notation on these slides that you could just safely ignore, but um, you just have to write it up somehow. So here's an example of like, if you know what a hidden Markov model is, um, of how you could um, kind of shoehorn this hidden Markov model into this uh, joint feature representation. Uh, so in a hidden Markov model, you would have, let's say, two types of potentials or two types of features. Um, one is shown here, where I would define a function that would look at a specific class, C, so one of the possible outputs, and I would look at each position along my label sequence. So I now have a label, uh, I have a sequence of, of of Ys and a sequence of, of inputs that corresponds to it. And I would basically pick out all positions where my output is equal to that um, given label C, and then basically add up the input feature vectors for those. So um, so this would kind of correspond to, in, a, in an HMM model, kind of the um, uh, model the, the, if you like in a probabilistic setting, it would model the probabilities of the outputs given the state of the hidden variable, right? Um, being C here, uh, so I collect these statistics, and um, and I'm also in the hidden Markov model. Usually, I would I would look at the combinations of neighboring labels. So I look at all uh, label combinations, one label C and another C prime, and I look at how often do they co-occur. Uh, next to each other with some index t and some index t plus one, so I can also compute that. So this would be in a statistical, if you write down a statistical model and so on and so forth, this would typically correspond to the sufficient statistics that you would extract from your data. And here, you know, those actually you put into, uh, into this um, representation um, that you're using. Um, if you're interested in um, ranking problems, um, for instance, then um, the way you could actually create such a combined feature function, maybe we just uh, primarily focus on this here, would be that you say, okay, I look at um, um, all of all pairs of items um, that I've ranked, and I have a variable that tells me whether the first item is ranked ahead of the second one or vice versa. So you can see this here has um, corresponds to a, a just a sign. And then I add up the differences between, let's say, these features uh, corresponding to the items. So um, if they're ordered in one way, I add them up in one uh, with, with, with a minus sign, let's say, and if they're ordered in the other direction, I add them up with a plus sign. So for instance, this is, um, a possible representation that you could then work with for ranking problems. Um, and um, again, I, I, I'll come back to that later, um, how you do that. But just to give you an idea of like what type of weird things you can encode in this function. Now, if you do things like uh, sequence alignment problems uh, and things like that, um, you would, for instance, have a situation where your input could be uh, two sequences, and then uh, your output Y would be specific way of aligning these sequences, right? So you could leave gaps or you could match certain positions and uh, and then actually the type of features that you could use here is things like, you know, what have you matched with what? Uh, where have you uh, gaps? So kind of an added sort of distance, but you could also look at all kinds of other features that you find uh, along Right. Once you've aligned things, you can then extract all kinds of features from from the sequences, maybe locally, uh, that are of interest. Uh, maybe the secondary structure uh, around that point that you're currently comparing, and things like that. And you can put all of that into 
um, into your feature function, or you might have some other method like some you know blast uh, profile that you you add into that. So I think um, conceptually. It, it, it's very nice uh, because you can, as you do in, in let's say, uh, standard classification, you can put in a lot of thought into like what features you would design. You, that kind of carries on here. You can be very creative about like features that you might want to extract uh, in for your specific problem. And you can also kind of relate back um, this setting to the multi-class setting, right? So the difference is now that here I have a shared parameter vector w, let's say, where in the multi-class setting I used to have a single weight vector, if you like, per class. And I can back, I can go back though to this multi-class setting where there's no generalization across outputs if I define, for instance, this uh, output kernel if I define the representation such that it is completely orthogonal for different outputs. So if I do a one out of M encoding and then effectively I'm back to the multi-class setting where I train each class separately, right? Because effectively with that output kernel, I'm saying that if I'm looking at different outputs here, it'll just be zero. So there's no generalization, there's no sharing whatsoever. Things are just orthogonal in my feature representation. Yeah. But of course, that is not desirable, but you can see that as a special case, um, you get that back. Okay, so um, so you can forget about all of this if you want and, and now move back to the more uh, abstract view of the world where uh, some uh, expert uh, of your domain um, has actually designed uh, these feature functions and now the question is how can you design a learning algorithm uh, that works with that. So what I will show here is um, what, what we would like to generalize is the standard uh, support vector machine approach. So uh, this is um, how it looks like in this uh, specific uh, formulation that I've given here. So uh, let me just read through that nevertheless. So we have a quadratic objective, we have weight vector, uh, a weight vector w, we have slack variables xi, and the objective function is basically a, uh, just the squared norm of W with some regularization uh, parameter lambda here. And then the one norm um, kind of of the slack variables and I would just scale them here by one over N. So it's just the sum of these size. The size are of course not negative. And then um, I have linear constraints of the following form. Um, the inner product between our, my weight vector and the feature vector of training example Xi and then multiplied by plus one or minus one, the binary label. And I want that, um, right, that is my, my signed margin. I want that to be as large as possible. So uh, in this setting here, of course, where I uh, kind of scale W, I fix the margin kind of to one, the desired margin. And in a soft margin world, I can use then the slack variables to uh, account for margin violations and then penalize them in the objective, right? So this is all standard, I'm sure. Um, you've seen that many times. And this is kind of just a notation here. So, uh, so okay, let's try to generalize that to uh, structured output. So the, the key uh, notion kind of that we need to generalize first is what is a separation margin or how would these constraints look like if we have structured outputs, okay? So, um, so if we think about that for, for a minute, right, in the binary case, what we, what, how, the way we can think about the margin is that we could get geometrically say that maybe the, 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 the um, um, discriminant function, the separating um, hyperplane in this case, and the point that we're trying to classify that that distance should be as large as possible. But we could also think of it that way that we're saying, um, the score that our model assigns to class plus one versus what it assigns to class minus one, that that gap between these two predictions should be as large as possible because that's effectively just twice kind of the signed distance to the hyperplane. And that's kind of the, the, the idea that generalizes to the structured view where basically we're saying the following, we have a correct pair and we look, in, look at the score that our um, current model with, weight, with this weight vector W gives that, 
And we can now look at all other outputs, right? all other Ys in our output set, and we can see what score we would give those, and we can look at the difference. right? And clearly, since we predict by computing the argmax over, uh, over this function f with regard to the y part, right? it would be desirable that the correct output gets the highest score and maybe by some margin even, right? So, so that the difference of the correct output relative to any other output should be as large as possible. Um, so what we will also do though is try to incorporate um, this loss function that we have and there are effectively two ways of doing that um, that have been popular in the literature. One is called margin rescale, the other is on the other slide, it's called slack rescale. Um, it's a little bit subtle sometimes how they are different, but so don't worry too much about it, but uh, you should just know that these possibilities exist. So here in this margin rescaled version, right, we take what used to be just a margin of one, kind of which was our target margin, and put the actual loss of predicting y when the correct output was yi. Okay, and then we have our slack variable here um, to account for any violations uh, that we observe there. So we would be saying that uh, if we have the correct output and we have another output that is really close, I mean that is almost as good as a prediction than the correct output, then this will be relatively low and then we are okay with a small margin of error. So maybe we even confuse those and make an incorrect prediction. But it's not so bad because the loss is small. On the other hand, if we have an output that's really um, has nothing to do with the correct output, so to speak, right? then we really want to learn uh, a scoring function by adjusting the weight so that we get a large safety margin, right? Because it would really be bad to make that incorrect uh, prediction. So that's kind of the idea of introducing that. Um, so um, you can also see that it's very easy that um, you kind of, um, if, if, if you go back to, um, Right, this term here, and you look at this part in the loss, which is like uh, um, an empirical error, that you actually get an upper bound on this loss function in the following way, that uh, if you fix W and then you optimize your slack variable, right? how would you optimize it? Well, you want this to be as small as, as possible, or as small as you know is necessary, or, uh, or as large as necessary but not larger, so basically you choose it as the maximum over, because it's reused in, in a number of constraints now for every possible y, it's the same slack variable, so you look at all these constraints and you look at the maximum of the difference between this and the left hand side, and that is what you will choose xi i to be uh, if you look for the optimal solution, right, because in the objective you want that to be as small as possible. So then if you if you look at that actually and um, you look at a particular y hat, so for instance y hat uh, being the prediction that we're making, okay, so it would be the argmax of this function f, then you can show that uh, this actually has to be larger than that specific case because here you look for the maximum over y, so if you choose y hat it can only be smaller or equal but not larger than the maximum that you had found here. Uh, and then if you look at this here, in the case where, uh, because this is y hat and y hat has been chosen as the argmax of that, uh, this cannot be positive, this difference, because this here is probably larger than this one or at least uh, it's kind of equal because maybe y hat i is the correct y i, then this is just zero. But in general, it'll be zero or negative. So then if you just drop this part, you get another lower bound, and then that's just the loss function between yi and y hat, which is the loss between um, the correct output and what you predicted. So the xi i, the value of xi i at an optimal solution, or optimal relative to w, will, so it can be some w, including the optimal w, um, but anyway, that xi i, that optimal, will be an upper bound on your, on your loss here. So that's kind of a um, convenient way to think about that. Um, so that effectively, right, what you have um, kind of here, this is now in the binary case, but we'll see how we'll write a similar Q, uh, quadratic program for the structured case. This then you can think of as being an upper bound on, on the empirical loss. So then there's a second way of um, 
defining the margin, which um, in practice, in general, some people have observed uh, often works better, um, but there's no real like theoretical, I mean, at least I'm not aware of a uh, really compelling theoretical argument of why it is better or worse, but uh, that's called slack rescaling. And in slack rescaling, we do the following. We look again at the difference of our scores, the correct one, and with regard to some y. And we say that we would like the margin to be one, so we have like the same margin, but, um, but violations of the margin uh, we penalize differently. So if um, a margin is violated for an output that is very with a with a loss that is very high relative to the correct one we want to penalize more right that is worse than if we violate a constraint for some output that is like almost as good as the correct output and so the way to do this is you can for instance write the loss in the denominator here so that if that is large, uh, effectively what that means is you need to make psi i larger to compensate for that, right? So if you have a violation with something with large uh, delta value, then psi i needs to be larger, and then psi i, of course, is the penalty that you pay in your objective, right? And, uh, and if this is, uh, this is very small, then um, already like a small value for psi i might might be sufficient to choose here. You can also just multiply through with this number, uh, then it's a little bit less compact, and then you see that you get the uh, delta here, but also in front of this here. So compared to this, you would also get this term uh, on the left-hand side multiplied by this difference. And you can go through the same argument as before, and you can also see that that also provides an upper bound um, on, on your empirical loss. So you have two upper bounds on your empirical loss. Um, none of them is uniformly better than the other. There are some advantages and disadvantages um, that I will talk about later at some point. Okay, so, um, so then you can also think of this like uh, geometrically. Um, so um, we are now in this high dimensional joint feature space that we've constructed from inputs and outputs and W uh, defines a specific direction in that space. So you usually, right, you can think of it as, as being a normal to some um, hyperplane. And what we do effectively is we have all these, um, uh, let's say for a particular training instance Xi, uh, we have all these vectors now, right? It's not just that we have a single point like in binary classification, right? We, we have a training point and we can see where it is. But, but here, for each possible output, uh, we will get a different point in that space, right? And what we effectively do is we project onto this line uh, the direction um, defined by W, and then we look at differences of the score, kind of the distance of that projection from the origin, if you like, the sign distance. And uh, so in this example here, Right, let's say we have the correct uh, training point here, it gets projected to this point, and then we have uh, one here, one here, different outputs, they get projected here and here, and then maybe the y hat, which is kind of the, the, the maximizer of, um, of our uh, scoring function f goes here, so in this, in, if, if we have a configuration like this with a given direction W, we actually have a margin violation because this one, this guy gets scored higher than the correct one. And what we would pay in terms of penalty in our objective is kind of this difference here. This is in the margin rescaling. We would kind of pay this difference plus the loss and that we would capture in this variable xi, right? And now of course, for, for this one training point, we would like to find a direction where somehow um, this point comes out kind of on top, right? So I guess in this 2D setting, maybe if we, right, if we would define a direction, if we would project, yeah, maybe a little bit here on the line that goes like this, maybe we could just barely make the projection of this point to be the one that gets the highest score, right? Now we, we work in a much, much higher dimensional space, of course, and also this is just for a single training point. So you now can imagine, for each training instances, you have this set of point, right? And if you pick a direction, that defines some ordering and um, some scores. Okay, so this is uh, then how we can formulate the structured prediction problem. And I've uh, tr oops, tried to highlight the differences here to the binary case. 
So actually the objective we can just uh, write in pretty much the same way. And what we do is we change uh, the margin constraints. And the way we do this is as before, as I said, with the margin rescaling, the margin of one gets replaced by this loss function value. And what we used to have here, which is yi times the feature vector for xi, actually becomes the difference of um, the two uh, scores that we compute. And if they are linear, then obviously we have inner product w times the representation on, uh, on yi minus inner product w in the representation of y. Um, I summarize that in this with this notion here, delta psi. Um, with, a, with an index i. So this is the definition of that guy, right? So this is the f of x i y i minus f of x i y that we had before in the linear case. It looks like this, right? And you can see that actually looks quite similar. Uh, but what you also have here is um, the number of constraints now has been largely increased. You can um, either include yi as a constraint or not because it's void anyway. But it has been increased from just one constraint per training point to m constraints if m is the number of uh, the cardinality of our output space, right? But the structure looks, uh, looks very similar. And, um, okay, and before we look at how we can algorithmically solve this, um, let's also look at um, what other, um, how the optimal solution uh, will look like. So uh, you can prove in this case actually uh, a representer theorem that generalizes um, the standard representer theorems that you have, let's say, for uh, for, for binary, uh, for logistic, or, or, or real-valued regression. And it kind of works like this. If you were to start in some reproducing kernel Hilbert space over this uh, joint inputs and outputs, uh, and you're given some sample set, and you have um, some functional that evaluates your, your function f, but that only depends on f through values um, on the sample, on the augmented sample, uh, s prime. So the augmented sample will just be, it, it, it will not just depend on xi, yi pairs, but actually on xi, y pairs for all other possible y's as well, right? This is actually the situation we have here, right? Because this, uh, in this formulation here, uh, it also matters, like you will also look at, um, all of these guys here, not just psi of x i y i, but also for all other possible y's. Um, and then you have some strictly monotonically increasing function that represents the regularizer. Then the solution of the optimization problem of finding the minimum over the Hilbert space of that functional plus the regularizer in the Hilbert norm can be written in the following way. Uh, or if we just look at the linear case, what we see is that actually the optimal weight vector Will we can we can be written as a linear combination of uh, these basis functions here, um, psi x i y, uh, for all possible values that y can take over that output space y. Let's say okay. So um, so you get something that's very similar to the binary case, only that uh, here the representation is finite, but it is. Uh, kind of finite but much larger. It's not just, uh, if you think of these as being support vectors and things like that, you, you, the number of support vectors is not just bounded by n, the number of samples, but it can actually be n times m uh, in the worst case. But it's still, you get this result of finite representation. And you can actually um, derive this also by, by um, looking at the Wolfert dual of, um, of this quadratic program. Um, so, you know, let me just show you that if you've, I assume here that you've seen how this works for the support vector machine case. So this is more um, just showing that basically very similar line of argument goes through in this case. So you form the Lagrangian function where you introduce uh, uh, Lagrange parameters. In our case, we will have particularly uh, alpha i y variables for each uh, linear constraint that we have in our primal. Uh, QP, um, and then when we will actually look at the gradient components with regard to the slack variables and the weight vectors, for the weight vectors you will basically get something that's very similar to what the representer theorem t told you. Um, you basically get this form here. For From this uh, 
uh, condition here, you basically derive something like a box constraint, but not on individual alpha um, variables, but on sums of alpha variables. And, um, and then you can actually uh, introduce, if you like, a matrix Q, uh, as, as is done here. Um, it's, it's basically a matrix of dimensionality D times the number of constraints, times the number of alpha variables that you have. And you can build it like this. It basically just, uh, it is these differences of these uh, feature vectors um, added up appropriately. And then you get to um, a very simple um, dual QP um, that kind of looks like that. You minimize some function that is uh, Q times alpha norm squared. Uh, they have a linear part that where the, uh, the actual loss uh, enters and you have a simple um, box constraint here on, on the sum of alpha variables. Um, so this is n times alpha. You can also see from, from this, we will come back to that, that it kind of corresponds, um, if you like, to a probability distribution. Um, so we will exploit that later. But you get like a very simple structure here, right? And if you compare it to the binary case, right, it's almost the same. Only here, you, you basically just had a, a, a one vector. Now you have um, something that is actually um, more differential with regard to outputs. And here, you know, you get you get a somewhat different box constraint. Um, but of course, what you what you have uh, in terms of as a challenge here is um, you have a much larger number of variables, right? So um, in the primal, you had let's say an exponential number if if the size of my output space is exponential in some length of a sequence, let's say. Here now you have, of course, the corresponding problem of having um, too many dual variables, right? So you cannot actually um, hand this typically to a QP solver um, of any type, like, you know, out of the box and just uh, solve it. It'll just be too big. Um, you also see that as in the uh, support vector machine case, you get a nice factorization. So the constraints only couple things that belong to the same data point. So there's no coupling across different indices, I. Okay, so uh, that is something that we will exploit later. And uh, you can see that actually you can make these alphas also a probability mass function if you want. Um, yeah, let's just um, look at... Um, yeah, let's finally look at um, the connection between this and the representer theorem. You could basically, from the uh, KKT conditions here, you get this optimality condition for, for W, which is this. And if you just uh, expand this and regroup terms a little bit, you get to this result here, right? Because this is basically uh, a sum, a linear combination of differences of these feature vectors. So if you group them in the right way, you have actual combinations of the feature vectors themselves. So that's not too surprising. So um, you just get a somewhat different parameterization. Okay, are there any problems so far? Yep. Uh, in principle, M could also be infinite, yeah. Um, well, then we need to look at the algorithms, like uh, we can come back to that, what they would actually do uh, in the case where, where M is infinite. I mean, we will have bounds that do not, um, on getting uh, approximate solutions that do not depend on M, right? So in that sense, um, it doesn't matter what M is, M could also be, you could have like, uh, the number of labels could just be unspecified. You could look at whatever label sequences of arbitrary length or something like that. Um, but but there's a there's something you need to be able to do over that space, and we come back to that later. Yeah, but in principle, um, that that could be the case, countably infinite. Yeah. So so what have we done so far? So I've I've told you how to build feature representations, where now you need to extract features from input output. Uh, pairs, not just on the input side, because the outputs are also more complicated. You want to generalize over the output side as well. Uh, and we looked at, um, we, we saw that we need the notion of like a loss function is really important here, um, how we incorporate that. We looked at how we can generalize the margin um, from the standard support vector machine case. Um, and then 
how we would get a similar quadratic program uh, with margin constraints and also what the dual would look like and like a representer theorem. So it's basically trying to be, take the SVM approach and, and you know, just seeing how we can really generalize in a very natural way. So now let's move to the more interesting part in some sense of, well, how could we, what, what should we do now with this, right? So I will actually write this uh, in a somewhat different form here. Uh, I'll do it as follows. So, um, so you see the objective is exactly the same and now the way I'll write the constraints because that's convenient for what I'll do later is basically I take uh, each constraint, so let's take the margin rescaling constraint. So the difference of my scores, greater equal loss function, uh, which specifies kind of the functional margin that I want minus slack variable. I look at, uh, I define the set omega iy is the, the, the set of uh, variables w xi that actually fulfill the constraint, right? So the feasibility region, so, so since this is a linear constraint, it's basically some half space, right? Given by like one side of uh, of this um, of of this, uh, this discriminant hyper this hyperplane that's defined in this constraint. Um, so then I can write my uh, my quadratic program. Basically, what what I'm looking for uh, is I'm looking for W xi that are um, fulfilling all these constraints, so they need to be in the intersection of all these half spaces, uh, omega, for every possible, uh, for every training sample, and then I need to look at each possible output, except the correct one. Okay, um, so that's just rewriting, I mean, you could just put that back here, but um, it's somewhat convenient to work with that. So, um, so, so now, how can we how can we solve this? And and what I show you here is basically um, what I'll show you is kind of ten years of research uh, that has gone into that because roughly around two thousand three this this whole um, work kind of started. So let's look at first before we do this um, have a little um, diversion here into like the very first algorithm that was developed kind of in in this framework at least. Um, that was one that actually would avoid this whole uh, problem of, of, of um, minimizing a quadratic program. Uh, and that was an algorithm called the Structured Prediction Perceptron by Michael Collins in 2002. So what uh, Michael did was basically, um, so he was interested in natural language processing in particular. Uh, he generalized uh, the perceptron update rule uh, to deal with structured outputs. So he would have this uh, joint feature um, map uh, psi as before, and he would generalize the perceptron as follows, right? You would look at your prediction at any given time for a given w, so your prediction is the argmax of that, right? So call that, you know, that's the same as this capital F of xi. And then I perform an update. If my prediction is incorrect, Right? Then I perform an update where I take the previous W, I add the feature represent the correct uh, feature vector, and I subtract the incorrect one, where as Y, I plug in here this, uh, sorry, this should be Y uh, with index I, um, um, the incorrect prediction that I made, right? So I compare like the incorrect prediction that I made and the correct output, and I correct W kind of in the direction of the difference of the two, right? So this is like, you know, the idea in the perceptron, the next time, like, the weight vector will get more aligned with, with this guy here and less aligned with this guy, and then hopefully, right, like if you do that often enough, you, you find a weight vector that scores correctly. So this is the update rule, and, uh, and if you predict correctly, uh, correctly, you do nothing, right? So it's just the standard, um, standard perception, right? In the uh, note that in perceptron, usually <coughs> what would be here is just uh, yi times phi of xi, right? It would just be usually adding or subtracting, right, the the feature vector. And here it's very similar. It's just um, sort of you know what 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 mistake you made is less clear, so you have to specify it here, right? In the binary case, as always, if I if the correct one was one, I know that kind of the prediction that I made, if it was incorrect, it had to be minus one because there's only two options. In this case here, if you made a mistake, it's not clear like, okay, what was the prediction that you actually made? And so, um, so it is a little bit more complicated in that way. 
But it was already, um, Michael Collins was already able to just generalize Novikov's theorem. So um, we would get convergence for the separable case uh, with a speed that, that would depend, the number of update steps, right, would, would be bounded by the margin. And also, uh, in terms of generalization, he could take a mistake bound and um, the standard perceptual mistake bound and generalize that to this case. So this is already an algorithm, like if you want to implement something, you could just go and do this. And still people today sometimes, you know, they just use this method because it's so dead simple to implement. Uh, and again, right, I mean, if you, if you think about it, right, what is, where, where do you get rid of kind of the complexity or the, the cardinality of your output space? Well, it is because at any given incremental update, you only look at one member of that output space, namely the one that you actually predicted. So all the other things you kind of don't care about. Might be that next time you cycle through your data that you pick, of course, another uh, output. But if you know that you can limit, let's say by Novikov's theorem, you can limit the number of updates you do to something like a notion of a margin, then that will not depend on the cardinality of your output space, for instance, right? So already you can see the cardinality of the output space might not be the most relevant thing here to look at, right? But things like margins might, might be um, interesting as well. Okay, so, um, so we will see that actually this idea of the perceptron algorithm of combining some kind of updates uh, of the weights and doing some maximization over the output space is actually uh, pretty common for this class of methods that I'm talking about here that are um, I call oracle-based methods. And oracle-based methods, dependent on what formulation of this margin, notion of margin we use, uh, um, might not just maximize this, but what they might need is a black box algorithm um, that maximizes this problem here. So let's say for margin rescaling, what we actually will, we will see, what we will need is something that provides me the argmax of this expression here. What is this expression here? Well, this is just kind of, if you like, the margin, the difference in my margin constraints between left-hand side and right-hand side, right, if I ignore the slack variable, right? So, um, um, so I would f I would need to find kind of uh, 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 an output that will maximize that sort of that will be as we will see like the maximally violated constraint typically if the constraint is violated, uh, and in the slack rescaling it is just a little bit different because the margin constraint was different. Okay. So we call that Oracle, and um, the, the reason why we call it Oracle is that, you know, for better or worse, in this, this class of method, we, we will just have an interface to some other algorithm that we will just consider to be a black box that actually does that computation. Like, can it be done efficiently? Um, that is very problem dependent and is a challenge on its own, right? But here in the design of the learning algorithm, we will just say, well, you want to get like one of the, you know, you want to use uh, this structured SVM for prediction. Um, you know, you need to provide a black box that solves um, this problem, right? Because you, it's you, let's say, as the domain expert who's going to be providing this, who's telling us like what feature representation to use for these functions. And we also need, um, we need you to implement kind of this oracle. And then uh, you will see that, um, we can, all the rest will be handled in a nice way by our algorithm. So, so this type of oracle call or separation oracle, uh, as we will see for the different methods that we will be looking at, it will be used to identify either violated constraints or possible update directions in the primal if we use subgradient methods or variables in the dual or update directions in the dual. So we will look at different algorithms and we will see that uh, we will always come back to um, the same um, um, oracle. Um, and the reason, by the way, why, why I have used an element notation here is that that, of course, might not be unique. There might be a set of whys that uh, maximize that. Okay, so, uh, so this will be like the picture, but um, that's just for reference. So these are like the 10 years. We will start with some early methods here and we'll see like what improvements. Um, have been have been presented, um, but that you can go back maybe later and look at again once we've uh, done a few things.
So, uh, so here's the, the simplest uh, approach that uh, when we published this originally in 2003-04, when we worked with this, like what like the simple-minded algorithm that we came up with at the time, and it worked as follows, that we would say, hmm, okay, we have this feasible domain, which is like an intersection of, of many constraints or half spaces. Uh, what if we could approximate that problem by a smaller set of constraints? So we would just select a much smaller subset, and then we have a relaxed QP, um, meaning that right, it is less constrained. So now if we solve the relaxed QP, then the optimum solution that we find, right, will now be one that potentially has a lower objective value than the true optimum because we've, right, we've, we've ignored some constraints. So, hey, you know, it's easy to do better. And, uh, but it is possible, of course, and very likely that what we find will actually be in um, this relaxed domain that we've defined, but not in omega, so it'll kind of be in that difference. But of course, at the end of the day, we want ideally something that, of course, solves our uh, uh, our original problem. Um, however, like here is one insight that we then had, which was, well, what if the remaining constraints, the ones that we haven't selected for our relaxation, the ones that we've chosen to ignore, and um, that is usually the vast majority of all, you know, almost all constraints, so to speak if we could still fulfill them with some tolerance epsilon, okay, so, so each one is a margin constraint, and let's say we are not able to fulfill them all, but, you know, we pick some that we fulfill exactly, and what if the rest we, we at least would be able to fulfill with some tolerance epsilon, which basically means the way the slack variables work, right, that if I would add just epsilon to my uh, vector of slack variables, that that would give me a feasible solution to the original problem, right? So they are violated by, by just epsilon, right? So if I increase xi by epsilon, then they're no longer violated because xi can now account for that epsilon violation that I might have. Um, then what would I gain? Well, then I would at least know that this solution here where I just take the uh, optimum on the relaxed problem and I add epsilon to the slack variable that, um, right, that this, this will basically be um, the objective that I had before plus epsilon. Why? Because um, this xi variable, right, we have one over n and the one norm of xi, so if we add epsilon to each component, right, then we get n times epsilon, one over, uh, one over n, so we basically just make the objective worse by epsilon, right? And that we know now is actually by this uh, condition here that we say this is feasible, we know that that will actually now be an upper bound on the optimum um, value of the objective function that we will get, right? And then what we have if we take these two, right, the optimum is lower bounded by the objective that we get for the relaxed solution, uh, and it is upper bounded by that number plus epsilon, right? So then we've kind of um, squeezed the correct objective between an upper and lower bound that are only epsilon apart, right? So, so, that, so that is like uh, a key insight here, okay, that, um, but now the question is, can we, can we ever be in a situation, like how many constraints would we need to select so that the rest of the constraints are still fulfilled by just some tolerance epsilon, right? That is still like the open question. Um, but anyway, so so we what we then basically did is is, is the following: you start with um, having no constraint. So at step zero, um, it's basically just W is an RD, and your select variables are non-negative. And then from that, you go in a um, iterative fashion. You take what you had before. You pick uh, some i y hat um, multi-index. Uh, you pick a constraint and you intersect that domain with the half space that uh, corresponds to that constraint, and then you have a new QP that you can solve, and then you can just go on and on and on. And um, what, we, what we want also is that the constraint that we pick here, that we uh, add uh, to strengthen our relaxation, right? So we have a relaxation, we add constraint, so that's called a strengthening, so we get a somewhat stronger relaxation. We want that uh, the one that we picked is at least um, 
uh, violated by epsilon. This is kind of what this is saying here with a little bit of maths, that the solution that we found to the previous relaxation uh, is not, uh, even if we add an epsilon tolerance, it, it does not fulfill this constraint that we picked, right? So we have this, even if we add that epsilon tolerance um, in, in, in that larger set, it'll still not be in there. So, so if you think about it geometrically, right, you have, do I have a picture for that? Yeah, so sorry, I have like a very poor man's uh, thing here. Um, and it's also very, very hard to actually read this, right? But this is like, uh, this is like our region, let's say, omega after uh, a certain number of steps. So we have this uh, relaxed domain and we find a solution here. And now what we want, for instance, is adding a constraint, let's say like this one, that would reduce the feasibility region to this side here. And the solution that we currently have is even not epsilon close to that uh, new feasibility region, right? So that we really uh, cut off the current solution here um, significantly uh, relative to this epsilon. And then we have to find a new solution, let's say that's here, right? And then we just continue. So we have a domain and we start like, you know, adding these half spaces to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, um, and then of course the, the, the way in practice you would do that is you loop through all the training examples, um, you call the separation oracle for that training example because that exactly gives you the maximally violated constraint. You check whether the violation is really greater than epsilon and if it is, then, then you add that, otherwise you ignore. And, um, and then um, if, if you don't find any constraint that is violated anymore, then you stop. Okay, so you make, let's say, uh, T step, capital T steps, and you stop. And, um, and so then, theoretically, uh, in that first paper, we've been able to show that the number of steps that, you're, that you have to do, or the number of oracle calls, to be precise, uh, we, let's focus on that, the number of calls, uh, strengthenings that you do, uh, is bounded by n over epsilon square. So, um, so in particular, the epsilon square um, um, dependency is interesting here. So if you want like a much higher, uh, uh, much smaller tolerance, right, then you will get a uh, larger number of steps. The way we've, we've done this at the time was basically by looking at the dual objective um, where if you select a constraint, you effectively add a new variable in the dual that you can now optimize over that was clamped to zero before, and then estimating of how much you could actually uh, reduce the dual by having this additional variable available. And this epsilon condition actually translates then into some amount that you improve the dual that is bounded away from zero and then you have like a, a lower bound on that dual objective. And from there, you can then actually estimate the number of steps that you need. Uh, later on, actually, people have improved that bound with somewhat uh, nicer analysis to something like n over epsilon. Now, which, which is significantly better. But, uh, but the important thing already here in this early result was that there's no dependency on the cardinality of y. Right, so as long as I find like these maximum violators, I actually need relatively few of those, and and then kind of I'm done. The rest will be automatically met with some um, tolerance epsilon, um, and um, so that was nice. Um, okay, so and this is just kind of I don't think we have to do that. It's just. Uh, kind of walking through that. So are there any uh, questions about this? Is, like, uh, is the general ideas clear of, of what you do here? Yeah. Okay, so um, why is this algorithm bad? Um, one, one reason why this algorithm is bad in, in kind of if you look at scalability, right, is that uh, you make a call to the separation oracle, you had a QP before, now you have a QP with one added constraint. And now you have to optimize that again. You have to solve a QP again. Now, of course, you might basically initialize with your previous solution and so on and so forth, but it feels a little bit, um, uh, a bit of an overkill to re-optimize the whole QP uh, every time you add a single constraint. So that is the main reason why um, this method is actually very slow. So then there's been um, some work on um, 
how can we improve this? So here's one idea, and um, in particular, if the Oracle calls are relatively cheap, right? we might say, hmm, why not call um, the Oracle for each training example that we have? We find a constraint that is violated, uh, if there is one, and then we take all of those uh, kind of in some fashion, and then we do an update, okay? Um, so that is possible, but in order to um, to actually get like uh, a certain analysis to work and to get guarantees, uh, you can't quite do it like that because the what we did in the single step uh, update mode, so to speak, where we would add just one constraint, was you always needed that you need to optimize over this with this additional constraint, and then you need to find another constraint that is epsilon violated relative to this solution. If we just do this in parallel. Uh, then that wouldn't be fulfilled. So we need to be, uh, we need something a little bit more um, uh, fine-grained here. Uh, so, or, or a modification. Um, so this is work done by um, Thorsten Joachim's and team then, where they um, basically uh, observed the following. Um, they summarized um, all these constraints that we could pick here, the, the oracle called n times would give us, let's say, n such constraints. And what they would do is they would basically put them all into uh, an average constraint by summing over the left hand and the right hand side of the constraint, more or less. So this is like how a left hand side looks like. Okay, there should be a delta here, sorry about that. Um, right? That Dif the difference between our scores should be greater or equal than the loss minus usually a slack variable, right? And so if I sum the left-hand side and I sum the right-hand side, and here actually I then get a sum over i xi i, uh, it actually turns out that the xi i's only show up in that sum form. So you could basically just have one slack variable that captures that sum. So it's also called a one slack formulation. So you have this zeta here. To, to model that. And um, so that's basically um, what they wanted to do. So then conceptually, how you, can, how you can actually model this is by something that is a little bit counterintuitive, but that just works out nicely, which is um, you blow up the number of constraints even more. You, you define uh, a constraint of that type for every combine, for every uh, sequence of outputs uh, for every training example. So you pick one Y for the first uh, training point, one Y from our output space for the second and so on and so forth. So you actually get cardinality of Y to the N. So M to, M to the M, right? I mean, M was already exponential, let's say, right, in many cases. So now this is like this already large number taken to the power of n. So it gets a little bit crazy in terms of number of constraints. But, but you can then apply the same epsilon approximation techniques that basically tell you, well, you know what? This, it doesn't matter how many constraints you have. What matters is um, that you can select a few constraints and that you then get uh, to an uh, ep epsilon approximate solution quickly. Okay, so this is the modification. Uh, instead of having uh, these individual constraints, you now have these uh, sum constraints and uh, the sum over xi i here or the one norm gets just replaced by this uh, zeta. And, uh, right, and then um, on that QP, if you like, you basically uh, do the same uh, constraint selection that we did before, but for this QP, a constraint is actually always involves, uh, uh, you know, each data point, uh, each of my training examples actually contributes to each constraint. So you make progress much, much faster as you do that. So you have like a whole batch uh, of constraints that you work with. And um, yeah, and so they, they, they already showed this one over epsilon bound uh, or, or n over epsilon bound if you call the number of oracles and uh, did a lot of uh, further analysis of uh, runtime behavior of this algorithm. I think this was um, huge speed up. So um, this is just from their paper <coughs> where, um, right, effectively, if you look at this here, the, the one slack formulation is this new formulation. N slack was the previous one. 
uh, CPU time, right? It's kind of a bit ridiculous here, sometimes order of magnitude. Here's a problem where the Oracle calls are actually uh, expensive relative to the optimization. And you can see that there things are comparable because in terms of Oracle calls, it doesn't actually buy you much, but you, you're you just much more efficient. Instead of optimizing n times, like again and again, you just optimize, re-optimize once after having added like this mega constraint. So that uh, buys you a lot. And then also, you get extremely sparse in terms of the number of support vectors. So if you look at this here, right, you can either add, let's say in this case here, you would add uh, 12,890 with whatever epsilon was set to here, right? So you would add that many constraints. Um, and then in order to represent your solution, let's say if you wanted to do this in a dual uh, form, then you would need to keep these guys around. But if you do this in this using these, these combined constraints, you only need actually 70 of those. Of course, in order to describe each of those 70, you need to 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 enumerate right one specific output y for each of the inputs n right so uh, and then of course if you look at uh, n times that number then you see that well that is actually larger not smaller uh, but still like in the dual for instance this would be the number of variables that your dual really has right so although there are like um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge output space and whatnot. At the end of the day, you're just solving uh, a QP with 70 variables. Um, so that, that seems very reasonable. Um, yeah, so that, um, I'm approaching the, um, the end here. Until when do I have? 25, okay. So we just, yeah, uh, maybe just move um, a little bit further. Okay, so. So this is like one of the key ideas that is being uh, exploited in this context is this successive strengthening, right? Where um, from the solution that I have found for relaxation, I find additional constraint or an additional constraint uh, that allows me to get an even better approximation to my problem. And uh, the Oracle calls are basically the mechanism, the black box mechanism, if you like, with which we find those. Um, glossing over like uh, the, the difficulties of, of implementing these oracles efficiently. And then the idea is that if I construct the sequence in a, in a good way that it'll pretty soon and some right very limited number of relaxation uh, strengthening steps, I will get something that is epsilon close to the optimum. Um, so the other approach it was um, to basically say, hmm, um, we um, we have this cube, you know, we've written down this, this quadratic program and so then, you know, we had like all these uh, linear constraints to deal with, but what if we actually wouldn't do that um, and we avoid um, writing these constraints um, and we just solve an unconstrained optimization problem. Um, and, well, how can you get an unconstrained optimization problem? Well, you basically just take uh, what would be the optimal choice of Xi, which is, again, this uh, margin violation, potentially, uh, maximized over uh, all possible outputs, right? That is what Xi i uh, star would be. Uh, just put that directly in the objective, right? And then kind of the constraint moves from kind of being a linear constraint here, moves up here. And then you just minimize that with regard to W. Now, of course, that uh, that has its own difficulties from the fact that now you have um, um, a piecewise linear objective. Um, so the objective is no longer a quadratic uh, uh, because this part, is, um, well, th this this part or the quadratic part, of course, doesn't change. But you now have. Um, uh, right, basically a piecewise linear part here, so. Um, uh, making this non-differentiable, and so adding now, you know, or now posing the question: How would you actually optimize that, right? But um, but it's also it's of course also I don't know whether you've you've learned about you know this Pegasus algorithm and the you know the solvers for uh, support vector machines and they do exactly that, right? They say, well, uh, why not forget about this QP formulation and work with um, this non-differentiable piecewise linear uh, formulation instead, an unconstrained problem. And so this is also um, a feasible approach that has been pursued and that uh, works very nicely. Um, 
So, so then what you would need to do in such, a, uh, in such an approach using subgradient methods, you would basically need to compute a gradient or a subgradient of this, right? And I have this little um, slide here to just explain that in general, right? So uh, what, does, what is a subgradient? So if you have a function like that, that has you know, some points where it's non-differentiable, um, then um, the subgradient in general is defined as a direction v such that uh, the linear approximation around that point, let's say x naught that I'm looking at, right, is, is a lower, is a minorant of the function f. So for all x, uh, you know, the, the graph of the function here is above um, that line, right? So, so that line here, the direction that defines that line is a possible subgradient at that point. But it could also be a direction that kind of more or less goes all the way to being uh, parallel to this line here or p parallel to this piece here, right? So it basically just says, right, if, if I have a point where f is differentiable, then it is just kind of the gradient uh, or, you know, or, or, or um, the, the tangent, basically, uh, uh, v becomes like the, the, the direction of the tangent. But if I'm at a point where it's non-differentiable, then you know, I have, it's not uniquely defined and I have a whole set and I, ch I can choose one from that set, let's say. So that's kind of what we, what we, let's say, do here. So what does that mean? It kind of means effectively what I, what I need to understand is going back to the notion of constraints, I need to understand which constraints uh, are actually active, right? If I, if I look at my W, like, where, which constraints really matter and, and what are the um, possible subgradient uh, in order to figure out the possible subgradient uh, directions that I have. So one way then of, of constructing a subgradient is as follows. I take just the gradient with regard to the quadratic part, so that's just uh, the direction is just w, uh, lambda w, and then when it comes to this part, um, what I do is I call again the oracle on this stuff here to find out what is, to find one member of the maximum. I could also identify the whole set if I could, and, and then I ha would have more choices for subgradient directions. But let's just say that magically my oracle gives me one, right? And then I can construct a subgradient like this. I'm basically um, looking at those yi's that I've determined, um, this delta psi vectors that we used before. You can show that this actually defines uh, a subgradient uh, for this problem, and so, uh, and then what you do is, in the spirit of, um, of of gradient descent methods, either in a batch version or in a more stochastic uh, single instance update rule, you basically optimize this function, right? So I compute, let's say, in the batch version, I compute this function, uh, this subgradient g and I have some learning rate, some step size um, schedule that I use, and then I just change w uh, in the direction uh, of the invert, of, the, of minus uh, that subgradient, and I do kind of a subgradient descent type of algorithm. And I can also do it in a single, uh, um, single instance case. And so, um, to conclude, and then maybe we break here, um, and then the rest of the material we leave for tomorrow. Um, but what you see is, interestingly, although it looks like this is this is really a different strategy. Right now, I'm not even building my QP, and now I'm I'm, I'm having like a non-differentiable objective, convex objective. But what you need to do, in some sense, is very similar. You again need to compute these yi hats, right? You need to be able to perform these arc maxes or what I call the separation oracle call, um, right? To pick out those. Only here you do it not to add additional constraints, but to identify a possible direction uh, in which you then make an update, right? Uh, and we will see also then tomorrow, like other methods, uh, the same uh, computation will show up. Um, so this has been uh, proposed, the, this is in terms of um, speed, I think comparable on, on many examples to the, um, to the improved cutting plane algorithm uh, that we said before, but this one is, is, is also extremely simple to implement, right? Because once you have this oracle, you can basically take something like also the, the original paper here or something like the Pegasus algorithm and um, you, can, you can solve these structured problems.
Okay, so let me uh, break here for today. Um, see whether you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thomas. Questions? In the original GP strengthening formulation, wouldn't the uh, location of the argument depend on the ordering uh, of the constraints, whether I say uh, uh, it's a epsilon relaxed constraint and whether I it's actually a fulfilled constraint, and wouldn't that also de like determines or have an effect of the generalization error, such that I would have to try different orderings of constraints, which I would have to fulfill stronger and which I would say goes into the epsilon relaxation? Mm, I didn't fully understand that. So, so which part are you referring to? Is so, I'm, so I'm first trying to fulfill um, constraints exactly and then I successively allow epsilon relaxation. No, no, you, um, you always have a set of constraints that you've selected and what you have to do is to exactly solve the in this in this simple a algorithm exactly solve your QP, right in that form. It's a relaxed QP relative to the original one because it only has a small subset of the constraints, right? And um, and when you augment the set of selected constraints, uh, you want to make sure that you add ones that are actually violated at least by epsilon, right? But then there's no like. It means that automatically then, after a certain number of steps, you run out of constraints that are violated by epsilon. This is what the analysis said. And that does, it has nothing to do with the order. Of course, the order then depends. There's not a unique set of okay. constraints necessarily, right? There, there, there's many you could possibly choose, right? Um, but it would, it would still hold that uh, once you've computed a strengthening that has uh, T constraints, this capital T in the analysis, right, that, that the others are, um, kind of in this analysis, that the others are automatically fulfilled um, up to epsilon. Yeah. More questions? Um, so, this is slightly less well formed, uh, but is there some necessary, so it seemed like I have a lot of degrees of freedom in defining what my psi of x comma y should be, but the out, it seems like the output features can't be too simple because it needs to be at least as complex as the loss function that I have, right? Because otherwise all I'll be doing is just rescaling those slacks to get like a trivial solution out. So. Right. Uh, is there like a lower bound on how simple my output features can be? So, I mean, in, in this approach here, it's... Um, the, so so the, the relation between the loss function and how that... What type of parts or aspects of the output that actually looks at, right, and uh, the feature function, uh, that is all like packed into the oracle sort of to deal with in some sense, right? It doesn't show up here as a problem, right? But I think you're right in the sense that, um, right, if, if my loss function would capture certain important differences between outputs, but my feature representation was not able to even like represent those, right? Um, it's pretty futile to try to, uh, right, optimize that. And maybe that, that argument could even be made uh, more formal. It is once we tomorrow look at the decomposition-based methods. Uh, there, I think usually you see like much closer. What are the type of parts that you capture in the feature representation, and also that the same parts of factors also contribute to the loss function, right? So things things will just be much more naturally derived from a factorization, right, of your of your domain. Um, then it becomes like clearer. So here. I mean, I agree. In this method, this this all looks somewhat uh, somewhat uh, like a mystery sometimes, right? What goes on? But but I'm actually a big fan of this because, uh, right? Maybe also like through my work at Google and whatnot, because this method has like just a very nice interface in some sense, right? I mean, you can you can build uh, 
like the, 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 the optimization and modeling piece, right, independent of specifics of the application and the interface is very clean. You can, of course, uh, if you look at specific domains with the decompose in specific ways, right, like specific type of factor graphs and whatnot, you can then maybe derive more efficient uh, specific algorithms for that where you really exploit that and so on and so forth, right? Um, so that is, that, that's why I uh, said uh, initially it's like a strength or a weakness dependent on how you look at it to use the oracle. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right. Conceptually, the loss function and the feature function psi with regard to the outputs, they, they are usually, they, they, they are like uh, co-defined in some reasonable way, yeah. Anything else? Maybe you can just say two sentences about, since you work for a company with a lot of data, uh, which of these, uh, so how many of your problems are in Google are uh, structured output problems? How common is it for people to use this kind of approaches? And does it depend on the data set size? Maybe you can say a few sentences about that. Um. Sure, I think so. So I think the it is still true that um, the larger the scale uh, at which we do things, the the more we try to come up with really simple solutions, right? So, for instance, um, like one example I alluded to was uh, optimizing, let's say, what we put on a specific search result page for users or things like that, right? I mean, you can either do it like in a framework like this, where you nicely try to capture like dependencies between all the things you could put there, or you can do it more in, an, in a kind of incremental way where you first put the most prominent element, let's say, and then condition that you've put it there, right? You then compute a prediction for the next one, so you basically have like, right, a sequence. It's like almost like in an HMM, if you would, instead of doing like optimal inference, you would actually do just greedily, right? You would choose the first label and then the next one you would condition on that, right? And I mean, we know like a lot of people have looked at that, of course, that the structured output prediction can do much better than that. But uh, but then often you know this is these are like the pragmatic uh, right trade-offs. Uh, then you get something if you get something that is much simpler maybe to implement, right? Um, then you favor that. So um, on the other hand, things that are maybe not like at extreme scale, um, you know, we have a lot of examples where we where we do use uh, structured prediction too. Right, but I would say like the real, real heavy guns that do the ads optimization and in the search context uh, uh, today, at least, that is still a little bit uh, too complicated, maybe, for people to to digest that to do that. Um, but I mean, that's even if you think, for instance, about like you know support vector machines and how nice it is to work with kernels and whatnot, right? Like, um, there's just no way. Right to work with dual representations, like for 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 some of the large scale problems that we deal with, right? So they are also, um, you know, we do a lot. Like we we need to simplify things a bit. But I th I still think that this is actually the, although there's now ten years that that kind of you know work has has happened here, that this is far from over. I think that the methods that we have are still not like fully scalable the way they could be. And I also think specifically on, 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 on a wide range of applications that we haven't fully exploited the potential that, that this gives us. And, and you can also see that, that there's ongoing literature in different application domains that discovers the structured prediction model. Of course, there's also things like conditional random fields and so on and so forth that I haven't talked about here that belongs to the same class um, that people also use. Uh, but it takes some time also to get it like uh, right run in production in a company like Google. <laughs>